Well, we're joined here today by Dr. Davison. Dr. Davison, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Now, you're probably the first guest that we've had that has made it into CNN and the Times articles as uh, apparently you work for NASA. Now, I have to ask you, Dr. Davison, how many aliens have you met? I haven't met any aliens. Um, I haven't <laughs> met any space aliens, although I suppose the Bible is full of uh, injunctions that we should be uh, warm towards aliens, which means, uh, <laughs> I suppose, uh, people who are sojourning with us, and I've uh, met some of them. Well, that's disappointing. I've read in these articles that it said that you worked for NASA. And of course, my initial assumption is, of course, you're working with extraterrestrial life. How have you not been able to meet any? Is there any truth to these articles at all? The articles were certainly onto something, but somewhere down the process of one news article reporting on another, uh, they got a little bit... Sorry, I'll should I start that again. Go right ahead. Yeah. Um, well, the news reports were certainly onto something, but I learned that news articles report on news articles and eventually error gets uh, introduced. And so the, the truth is, yes, I was here in Princeton for a year uh, between 2016 and 17 to work on theological implications of life elsewhere in the universe. And the project was funded by NASA, but I wasn't employed by them directly. And I think that's where uh, many of the articles were, were wrong. So the Centre of Theological Inquiry in Princeton, a fantastic research institution, and in fact, I'm back here at this uh, very moment for, for two years. Uh, they had an inquiry, as they call it, on the societal implications of astrobiology. So that's the place of life in the universe, which ran from, I think, 2005 to eight, something like that. I was there in the middle of it. And it was mainly theologians, but there were um, ethicists as well. And it was mainly Christian theologians because that's the tradition of the center, but there were representatives uh, from other uh, faith traditions as well. And they had this tr tremendously innovative and I think productive three years thinking about life elsewhere in the universe. And there was NASA money behind it, but uh, the, the crucial thing that the reports got wrong is that they weren't hiring us directly. Great. Well, uh, what what sort of drew you to this fascinating topic of uh, theology and extraterrestrial life? I would say that it struck me as being a good topic for teaching. That was the first thing. So I have a third year paper in Cambridge, a course, you'd say, uh, which is on themes in contemporary biology and thinking about them from a theological perspective. We look at developments in evolutionary theory, neuroscience, technology, all sorts of things. But we, one of the things that it includes is life elsewhere in the universe. And it struck me as a topic that would easily engage the interest of students, and that does turn out to be the case. So I first got into it in quite a general way by thinking this would be a great theme to bring into my teaching. I also had no noticed more generally that there was a surprising lack of attention in theology to, to life, biological life as a topic. I mean, obviously we think about various charged moral questions, often medical ones to do the beginning and end of life, and that's uh, important for theologians to address. But the nature of life itself doesn't get looked at very often. And you can see that by looking at encyclopedias of theology and dictionaries of theology, they'll generally not have an entry on life. They might have an entry on eternal life, other, I can think of one that has an entry on the tree of life, but it doesn't have an entry on life. So that had already provoked my interest in, in doing some work that was on the nature of life. And then this job uh, research opportunity came up uh, at Princeton, at the Centre of Theological Inquiry. And I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this. I'll throw my hat into the ring. And I got that uh, nine month period there working on it. And I started writing a book on the implications of life elsewhere in the universe for the whole range of topics in Christian theology. You might say Christian systematic theology. So that's the kind of theology that goes through creation. Who is Jesus? Uh, what does he do? What's sin? What's eternal life? What's God? Uh, who's God? And um, so uh, that book is with the publishers now, with the Cambridge University Press. It can be out, I think, at the beginning of 2023. And I really go through all the big themes in Christian systematic theology and say, 
if you open the newspaper tomorrow and there's evidence of life elsewhere in the universe, what difference would it make to these doctrines? I try to put them a bit in their hist this question in its historical context, which we could talk about a little bit more. I think that the history side of things um, has, has proven to be interesting. Um, and so that's the story. I started out interested in it because of teaching. Then I ended up in Princeton thinking about it for a year, writing this book up. And then something we could we could talk about later, perhaps, is the new centre in Cambridge, which um, I'm happy to put together on life in the universe, which has a strong arts and humanities angle to it. And then I'm back at the Centre of Theological Inquiry. They've very generously given me a fellowship here for the next two years, and they're a partner in this Cambridge Centre. And so it's very much back on my um, on my radar screen of things that I'm working on. Uh, I should say that also my, my background is as a chemist, first of all, and I did uh, Oxford a doctorate in biochemistry. So these scientific questions are always bubbling around in the back of my mind for, for that reason. And what, and Dr. Davison, what is the title of your upcoming book? It has the very prosaic title of Astrobiology and Christian Doctrine. So you'll find that publishers are less and less enthusiastic about poetic titles of books because they are thinking about search engines. And so they want just a string of words that will turn up nicely in, string, uh, in uh, search engines. And it used to be the case that books had poetic titles and descriptive subtitles. But if you look nowadays, they tend to have descriptive titles and poetic subtitles, if you get one at all. Yeah, let's go ahead and jump deep into the topic. So you have, you said a doctorate in, you said chemistry, correct? My undergraduate degree is in chemistry, and then I did a DPhil uh, doctorate in biochemistry before going and on bio to theology, and then I did a theology degree and a, and a theology uh, PhD later on. But my, my, my roots are in chemistry and biochemistry. Great. So my next question has to do, you brought up the history element of it, and that's something that's fascinating. I did wasn't planning on talking about that, but I'd love to hear a little bit about that. This was one of the surprises for me that the Christian church, Christian theologians have been thinking about life elsewhere in the universe, theological implications, pretty much con continuously since 1450. That's quite surprising. I, I didn't know that until I uh, started looking into this in a bit more detail. So you've got a Franciscan who is called William of Varouillon, I think, something like that, uh, who is a quite prominent theologian in the 15th century, and Nicholas of Cusa, who is every theologian's favourite 15th century theologian, um, and uh, you know one of the absolute uh, masters for the ages. And both of them mention life elsewhere in the universe. Both of them take it in their stride, and both of them move on frustratingly quickly. So Cusa gives us a paragraph at most, I'd say, really just a, a few sentences, really. And he he expects that there's life elsewhere in the universe. I think he even thinks there is uh, life elsewhere in the universe and um, just moves on. And uh, William gives us a little bit more, and he does bring in some theological topics like sin and relation to Christ and so on. But even then, he moves on after a, a paragraph. And this seems to be the pattern that by and large, theologians were just not worried about it enough to write about it at great length. So um, John Ray is sometimes described as the father of, um, of British natural history writing. He has this wonderful book called The Wisdom of God in the Works of Creation. I think that's what it's called. And he has a paragraph in which rather, I think in a rather advanced way for his time, he, he recognises that the stars are other suns and he thinks they'll have other planets around them and the planets will be inhabited and that's marvelous and it displays the glory of god and the plenitude of god uh, and that's it he just he just moves on or uh john wilkin do i mean or wilkins john wilkin i think um was bishop of chester he'd been master of oxford college cambridge college um and a founder of the royal society he was one of the first secretaries of the royal society the uh, preeminent uh, English scientific society um, of great renown. And he wrote a book about life beyond Earth 
And the fascinating thing is that even though it's you know, a reasonably long book, the, the doctrinal bits, the bit about Christian theology, they're, they're just like one column in, a, in a, one of the pages. Um, so there's this very long history. I mean, I could go on and on about this. Um, when when uh, Anthony Trollope, the great Victorian novelist, wanted to show a group of women, ed sort of educated, ordinary upper middle class, I suppose, uh, women, not, not sort of academic specialists, um, talking about the things that people were talking about. He has them talking about life elsewhere in the universe and uh, mentions the theological implications. Um, and that, that, that's been a good indication that people were talking about this in uh, Victorian times. Harper's Bazaar magazine had a story about it in the 1910s, I think. So it's just pretty much continuous interest in this topic from a theological perspective. Uh, from the middle of the 15th century, mainly taking it in their stride, frustratingly writing not very much, pre precisely because they're not that worried about it. So when Carl Sagan wrote, what, in the 1970s, maybe, um, that uh, it, it's such a disappointment that the world's religious traditions have not been interested in this topic, and it, you know, it's to their detriment that they haven't been, uh, he actually just doesn't know his history there, because um, uh, in my own Christian tradition, People have been thinking about it for a long time. And the same same could be said for, I think, uh, Islam and Judaism, for instance. Yeah, so when it comes down to it, though, it does still seem like there's, as you notice, it wasn't a pressing topic. It seems like there's a sort of, it's a cursory issue. Has it become more pressing to the church in recent times? And if so, why? Well, the big date here is going to be 1995, when Didier Kahlo and Michael Major um, discovered the first planet around another star, the first exoplanet. Um, and Didier is now in Cambridge, is professor of astrobiology, ast uh, of astronomy rather, and he's uh, leading the new centre that we're setting up. And he was just in his 20s when he made this discovery. He was awarded the Nobel Prize a few years ago for having discovered the first planet around another star. So that really did change everything. Um, in the previous centuries, the jury was out really about whether there will be planets around other stars or not. There were two theories about how solar systems formed. One would produce a planets just naturally, you know, perhaps almost every time. It's the nebula hypothesis, which is about these things co co coalescing out of dust. And then there was another theory, which was that you only get solar systems when one star bashes into another or a comet bashes into a star, the collision hypothesis, which happens unbelievably rarely when you think how much space there is between stars. They just basically don't encounter one another. Um, and the Enlightenment angle actually had been a little bit, more, well, people argue it both ways, but um, Kant, interestingly, the philosopher had been behind the nebula hypothesis, which proved to be right. But the other one uh, held sway for quite a long time. So it wasn't really until the 20th century that people were starting to think that there might be lots of planets around other stars. And it wasn't until we actually found one that we could be, could be certain. But I think even the people who favoured the frequent formation of planets theory have been taken aback by just how many there are. So they're just completely garden variety stars to have planets around them. Um, and you probably can't read the newspapers the last few years without having come across stories of new uh, planets discovered and new uh, solar systems. So I think that's what's changed things, that before 1995, we couldn't really be sure that there were other planets and planets are the most likely habitable thing. Um, and then since then, the, the data has just been uh, just pouring in. So I do talks about this quite often in schools, and I tend to look at the internet on the morning and find out what the latest number of thousands of planet says, and I can give the kids uh, absolutely this morning, although it's probably up by one or two since this morning, uh, this is this is the answer. So that, it seems to me, is what really has, has changed everything. The first thing, 1995. Uh, and then the other great date, let's hope it's, this turns out to be the case, would be Christmas Day 2021, when the James Webb Space Telescope was launched. And that's significant because it's one thing to be able to discover that there are planets around a star. But what we want to be able to find out is if there are any signs of life. And the James Webb Space Telescope is uh, primed, is designed to look at light in the infrared region. So um, exactly the region in which you get 
data about what chemicals are present. I mean, you get data, I suppose, in lots of different wavelengths, but the, the infrared is particularly useful for detecting what gases might be present in the atmosphere. And that seems to be our best hope for detecting life. If you looked at the Earth from a long way away and you looked at the gases that were in our atmosphere using uh, infrared uh, spectroscopy, so it's just seeing what, what, what wavelengths get absorbed in, that, in those frequencies, uh, you would think that something very strange was happening because there's lots of oxygen, 20%, whatever it is, 21%, which is very reactive. You know, why is that sticking around when it's so reactive? And even stranger, oxygen is sticking around in the presence of molecules, chemicals that it reacts very readily with, especially, say, methane. So if we turn the tables and we look at other stars from here, other planets from here, and we find that there's a mixture of chemicals that wouldn't naturally stick around together, then that would be a fingerprint for something odd going on. And depending on what the gases are, it may well be an indication of life. So we really are now, and really only in the last year, uh, poised to be able to, to say that we'll get data that would give away the presence of life elsewhere on, on another planet. And that's why I think it's a question for the moment. When you, when you talk about life um, on other planets, I mean, uh, I, I think there's kind of like three different ways to see this sort of unintelligent life, like cells and that sort of thing, or it could be intelligent life on other planets, or we could be talking about intelligent life that's coming here to visit us. And that's where you get into things like UFOs and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, how do you see these different types of discoveries impacting us differently when it comes to faith? Um, would the discovery of one have a very different impact from the discovery of the other? Those, Yeah, because it kind of seems like with the James Webb, we're only dealing with, you know, microbes on Venus. Well, not Venus, but like a, a extrasolar Venus. And that doesn't seem to quite have the sort of uh, robust impacts, you know, that uh, uh, an alien UFO landing on the White House lawn might. Mm. Um, well, I, I might be inclined to think that the UFO would land uh, on the lawn of uh, Windsor Castle, but um, uh, <laughs> it's difficult to tell. We just have to wait and see. Um, I mean, you're absolutely right. This is an important question, and the imagination of you know, public imagination is obviously informed by lots of science fiction films that are all about uh, encounter. And what we are able to do with things like the James Webb Space Telescope is look for it out there rather than waiting for it to come to us. So, so previously, I think people were fixed on intelligent life also because the, the other prospect of discovering life out there without it having to come to us, was that we might find the signs of technology. So most obviously radio broadcasts, something like that. But people also talk about the ways in which an engineering project on a big enough scale, like one to try and capture all the light from a star, for instance, would give itself away in terms of uh, the, the kind of infrared light that would probably be given off by that sort of endeavor. So until we had this capacity to look at the atmospheres of other planets, we, we really were only thinking about life because it was the only way it could give itself away. Sorry, we were only thinking about intelligent life, yes. Before before the James Webb Space Telescope and this kind of technology, we were thinking about intelligent life because it was the only kind that would be able to give itself away. The center that I'm involved with in Cambridge is very much on the origins of life. So they think that once you get to life, once you got to a single cell, that would be Kind of game over that you know you just add just add history and you get you know uh, advanced stuff they're, they're interested in the transition from inorganic into organic into, into life uh, and once that gets that, that's the great question that that is uh of, of interest to people and i don't think we should let that go i think if it turns out that the life the universe is full of life whether it's intelligent or not or whether we know whether it's intelligent or not that is still an astonishing thing it tells us something about the whether the universe is kind of poised to bring forth life or not you know is it is it unbelievably rare or is it 
kind of in the DNA of the universe that when the opportunity arises, life will arise. That does seem to me uh, a really interesting question. Well, how would when that was, create? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, when I was here uh, in Princeton five or six years ago, we had lots of wonderful scientists come to talk to us, and they kept saying to the theologians, don't get fixated on intelligent life, because the chances are that there are thousands, millions of times more non-intelligent life, plants with non-intelligent life than there are with, uh, with uh, intelligent life. Of course, there are really interesting questions here about what we, how we define intelligence and so on, but we could probably let that, let that ride for now. Um, and if you just need to think about the history of the Earth, you know, for however many, what, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, we've had uh, sentient hominids. And for whatever it is, a billion or two years before that, a uh, billion years, we had, we had life. So for the tiniest sliver of Earth's history, have we had intelligent life compared to um, uh, life before it? That, I think, gives us some kind of indication of the, the distribution. Um, but the chances are that if we detect life, it's going to be uh, uh, unintelligent life. Now, my book tracks then towards asking questions about intelligent life, despite what the scientists said to us, because there's a chapter on life, this chapter on habitation and habitability. There are certainly things you can write about that are in interesting about you know, life as such. But I think the theological mind is always going to go towards sentient life because of the categories that we're most interested in. We're interested in, uh, in love and memory and intelligence and relationships, but not just a relationship that's like between one object and another, but the kind of relationship between persons. We're interested in persons. We're interested in sin and redemption and uh, these sorts of things. And so even if only, if there's any life out there, one in a million instances of it is intelligent, I think that is whether the, whether the scientists like it or not, that is probably where the, the theologian's mind is going to be attracted. And we're talking about the most astonishing numbers here. So this is the thing about, you know, what, why do this work now? Uh, I'm just trying to remember these numbers off the top of my head. But if, say, 20% of stars are sun-like, if 20% of those stars have got Earth-like planets, then I think it's something like 16 billion billion Earth-like planets around sun-like stars in the observable universe. So even if a you know, relatively small number of those have got life and then a relatively small uh, number of those uh, have got uh, intelligent life, we, we're still uh, potentially talking about really uh, enormous numbers. That's now scientifically, that's a good case for thinking that there's something out there. But theologically, if I were to press you, does your belief in God and Christ, does that press you to think that there's going to be more life in the universe or less life, or does it have any impact at all? Theologically, are we as Christians tilted one direction or another? I think that's a great question. And it's actually a really good general question beyond just this particular subject matter for thinking about the relationship between scientific thinking and theological thinking. My instinct is to say that I'm wary about making scientific claims on the basis of of theology because it feels like a bit of a mismatch of domain there of, of responsibility. Um, also, I'm a, I suppose I'm a wary of um, making claims that then if they were disproven, it would seem to bring the faith into disrepute. Um, it seems to me God has made the world to have its proper integrity. Science describes that. It seems to me the job of the scientist to to answer basic scientific questions like that. And having said that, one can have one's instincts. So I'd probably want to make a distinction about saying, I'm not going to tell the scientists their business about such things as um, whether the production of life is easy or not, for instance. Uh, but I might have my instincts. I might say, uh, I can take both answers in my stride. I should be able to. But one of them might seem to accord a little bit. More. Um, or all other things being equal, this is where my instincts lie. Then I think it matters what kind of Christian theology you uh, you go for. So my general 
you know, guiding star in most things is Thomas Aquinas. I'm what you call a Thomist. Um, he's a Dominican friar of the middle of the 13th century, middle of the end of the 13th century, and just one of the greatest intellects uh, you know, that's ever, ever been. And just an absolutely astonishing thinker who is in, very biblical, very philosophical. He knows the Greek Christian tradition. He knows the Latin Christian tradition. He knows lots of uh, philosophy. He, he brings that very um, productively in. Anyway, I'm a, I'm a great uh, flag flag flyer for um, for Thomas Aquinas. But if you came from a different theological perspective, you, you really might answer things slightly differently. So I'm not going to sort of speak for all Christians. But if I'm going to speak from my own perspective, um, he would say that the boundlessness of God, the, the plenitude of God, uh, is reflected in creation through multiplicity and diversity. So he's a great celebrant of the fact that the world is so rich and diverse. And he doesn't think that that makes a perfect image of God. In fact, the creation and creator are completely incommensurate. Nonetheless, the kind of um, respect uh, the, the creation will pay to its creator is through multiplicity. Uh, it's a beautiful vision, I think, of, of manifoldness and diversity uh, and relationship as well. It's not just that there are lots of different things, but he, he loves the entanglement of, of all these things being in, in relationship to one another. In fact, one of the reasons that people in his period thought that there probably couldn't be life elsewhere uh, in the universe, uh, they thought it was a serious argument against it, uh, was that it would be disconnected. And they saw that the world, they thought the world was made for relationship. And the idea of a sort of civilization that was disconnected from another one, they thought uh, was a kind of a, offensive uh, to their, their theological uh, instincts. Uh, I, I reckon there's something beautiful about that, but if, there are lots, if there's lots of life and it doesn't know about one another, you know, that's probably not an insurmountable uh, barrier from a theological perspective. So if you're someone who's, who celebrates the diversity and multiplicity of creation, uh, then that might turn your instincts towards thinking that the, that the universe is going to be contain lots of life. But as I say, I'm not going to prescribe things one way or another uh, for, the, for the scientist. One of the things theologians have sometimes said, and I think here this is wrong, is to say there's got to be lots of life because otherwise what's the point of all the rest of creation? There's a French theologian who said, uh, if that's true, then the plinth is too big for the statue. And I think that's wrong um, for, for a couple of reasons. One, if the whole universe in a, of un, incomparable size only had the, the life of Earth, that still seems to me not too big a plinth for that statue. Because I think there's something about when life comes into existence that is just so astonishing that it, it is of a, of, just a, of, a, of a singular glory. And then when that becomes conscious and it can relate to one another and it can relate to God, that is of just such astonishing dignity that there should be things upon earth that are made in God's image. If, if that was all there was in the whole universe, I don't think that would be a waste of all the rest of the universe. I also think it's a kind of rude, rude thing to say that other stuff isn't important just because it doesn't contain life. So if there are all these amazing pinwheel galaxies and black holes and nebulae and so on. They're glorious too. Uh, I, I think that to say that they're just the background for human life would also be a problem. I'm sure God takes delight in the, the glories of all of that as well, even if I think life is of a, of a su supremely uh, glorious order. So um, there would be theologians who say that there's got to be life everywhere because otherwise what's the point of all that other stuff? And I don't take that line. But the idea that the plenitude of God tends to be reflected in the world in multiplicity, that does make me instinctively enthusiastic, let's say, about the prospect of uh, there being a variety of life. But I let the scientists pursue their course in a scientific way. There seems to be uh, this connection that I feel, at least out there in popular culture, that the discovery of intelligent life on other planets would somehow displace our importance and somehow cut chip away at the Imago Dei in the same way that people often assume that sort of the Copernican revolution displaced humanity at the center of the universe uh, by 
removing everything revolving around us and having us revolve around other things. Um, and maybe I get this from sort of Douglas Adams or those types of things. I'm not sure, but w- w- how would you kind of respond to that sort of thing that pairs uh, the discovery of a broader universe of life with kind of a retreat of this religious view of the human person and the Imago mm-hmm. Dei? Well, there's so much to be said about this, and there's a, there is, I can, I'll try and do my best, but um, there's so much to be said, and there's a chapter on this in the, in the book. Um, so one thing I think to say is it's just a mischaracterization of Christianity and, prob- and I'm sure of the other Abrahamic uh, faiths to say that it puts humanity at the center. Now, this might sound like a trite thing to say, but it puts God at the center. And that is tremendously important. You know, if, it's, it, uh, if it turns out it's not all about us, well, that's not news uh, to, to Christianity. So that's an uh, obvious point to make, but I think the most important one to start off with. The second thing to say would be, I think, to mention the place of angels in Christian thought. And I'm not particularly uh, you know, taking a saying that has to feature in your uh, vision of the world, although I think it's pretty integral to Christianity. But to say that down all of those centuries, there's always been a sense that there was other stuff. Now, I'm not at all equating uh, alien life with angels. I, I, I'm a Thomist, so I tend to think of angels as being immaterial, for instance. Um, but the point is that within the Christian imagination, there's always been other stuff, other things, other inten- intelligent things, other things that God's interested in, other things that relate to God. Uh, so it's not like we're suddenly going to find out in 2025 that there are other beings in creation, if that, if that happens. Uh, so the theological imagination has always had a place for other things. I also think of the book of Job. So I, the book of Job is like this great safari where God doesn't answer Job's question directly. He just takes Job on this trail around creation and says, look at this thing. Do you know about that thing? How about, you know, th- this star system and this this amazing creature and um, Leviathan and, and so on? And I think this is really directly addresses your question. That passage of Job is about saying, there's lots, of, there's more to creation than you know. God has interests, you know, beyond you, and it's not all about you, and it puts puts humanity in its place. So I, I always like going to aquariums because I think it's like walking a bit through that chapter of Job. Just all this incredibly weird stuff and glorious stuff that we, you know, just getting on with its own business, we don't see it all the time, but God knows about it and cares for it. So I think the book of Job already uh, helps us to have an expanded vision. So there, there's some sort of... Uh, general questions. I also think this is a wonderful topic to answer about, but to, to, to you know to, to think about because it helps us to think what we mean about the imago Dei, the image of God, and to ask some fairly fundamental questions about it. So if people think that because there's other stuff, we are somehow devalued, what they're saying is that the imago Dei is basically a competitive category, whereas I absolutely don't think it's a competitive category. Uh, I tend to think of it in objective terms. You know, you're in the image of God because uh, you relate to God and to one another, or you're in the image of God because you have memory, intellect and will, uh, or you're in the image of God because you have a certain uh, role or capacity. I mean, probably I'd say all of, all of the above. It just doesn't seem to me that any of that is diminished because there's other life elsewhere of which that would be true. We could even say that of the earth. If it turns out that chimpanzees, it doesn't seem to be the case, but if it turned out that they had a, a rich, you know, interior moral and spiritual life, or that dolphins uh, did, I don't feel like I would be demoted because they they do too. I my attitude is to say the more the merrier. I just don't think it's a competitive thing. Uh, and then maybe the last thing to say on that is that the glory of what God does with human beings just doesn't seem again to be diminished, even if there are other stories about what God does elsewhere. The, the story that we tell in my tradition of beginning in Advent through Christmas, Epiphany, you know, Lent, Passion Tide, Easter, uh, Ascension, Pentecost, that the glory of that, that's, 
the story of God's dealings with us just doesn't seem to me uh, diminished because God might might do, uh, you know have, there might be other stories to be told. Well, I, I was when I was here in Princeton to approach this from a slightly different angle uh, last time. There was this amazing string quartet that was giving a performance of all of Beethoven's string quartets, one of the absolute crowning glories of music. And I was working on this at the time, and I was in the concert hall one evening, and I thought, this this quartet is just a, a, a musical miracle. And if there are other cultures elsewhere that have other amazing artistic cultural uh, products, that doesn't diminish Beethoven. You know, Be Beethoven is this this string quartet, this Bach cello suite, whatever, is no less glorious because there might be other things. Just as you know, I'm not a great appreciator of jazz, unfortunately, I've spent enormous amounts of time listening and reading music, uh, reading about music, uh, but I have a bit of a failure to appreciate jazz. But I recognise that it is as great a musical tradition as the classical music that I tend to listen to, and I don't think that Bach music devalues this jazz musician's uh, music or vice versa. Anyway, there's an analogy. I love the fact that you pointed out, you know, God, not humanity is at the center. But what occurred to me while you're talking is, well, if we're going to talk about God as Christians, God became human. So you can't really talk about God without talking about humanity, which kind of puts them back in the center, right? God didn't become a dolphin. But what then of extraterrestrial life? Do wouldn't we need an incarnation for every single one? What do we do with Christ? Is he mm -hmm. uniquely human? So I think that raises a whole host of issues. And I just want to open that up to you. I would say there's no other area of theology that invites quite as much consideration when it think, we think about life elsewhere in the universe as this topic of the, the nature and person of Christ. And it has been quite polarized uh, People tend to belong to one position or another. Uh, people who really don't like the idea that there could be more than one incarnation and people who, who think that's the, the natural way for things to be. Um, I think there are five chapters on this in the book. So I, I recognise that it's a, it's a big topic. I maybe would come at it by talking about different ways of asking the question. So one way of asking the question would be, is more than one incarnation necessary? Another would be, is more, more than one incarnation possible? And again, these tend to be quite separate conversations and people tend to belong to one camp. I'm asking this kind of question or I'm asking that kind of question. So I think I'm going to reassure people who, I hope I'm going to reassure people who think that I'm somehow devaluate, devaluing uh, Christ by saying, I don't think that more than one incarnation is necessary. I think a drop of Christ's blood can redeem the entire cosmos. I think that uh, Jesus is God, the Son, the Word, united to a human nature. And that can be seen as, or it is, a matter of God uniting himself to creation, to creaturehood. So um, it's perfectly possible, I think, to say that every creature everywhere could recognise that God has come to them in coming as a human being, because in coming as a human being, God has come as a creature. Or a, a me medieval category that can do quite a lot of work is the idea of the rational creature. There are the rational animal, Aristotle, basically. Um, so you could say that in becoming a rational animal, God has united himself to all the rational animals. And that would be enough. I don't think any more than that is necessary. On the possibility question, um, it's not my job to say what is and isn't possible to God, but the tradition has generally t tended not to want to be that prescriptive. I mean, God can't do, do uh, things that are just nonsense. Uh, C.S. Lewis is great about this. You know, you can't put together a, a, a jumble, a salad of words that makes no has no meaning and then say, put the words God can in front of it and suddenly it becomes uh, sensical. So uh, there are some people who have argued that there couldn't be one more than one incarnation because it's just that kind of thing, a kind of nonsensical jumble of words. But I don't take that line. Um, I think it would be possible for God to unite himself to more than one creaturely nature. Um, 
the, the angle I want to take on this is not actually what's necessary or what's possible, but what is suitable or fitting. And I leave that in God's hands. So I, I don't know whether it's necessary. I don't think it is. Uh, I don't know if it's possible. I think it is for there to be more than one incarnation. But what I do know is that God will do something that is supremely suitable or fitting. And within that framework, I can explain to you why my instinct is to say that I think there will be something supremely fitting about multiple incarnations. But if that doesn't turn out to be the case, you know, let the judge of all the earth do right. God will do the beautiful, fitting, uh, suitable thing. So I, I'm happy to talk about that, why I err on the multiple incarnation side. I like the idea of multiple incarnations. It is odd thinking that there might be multiple incarnations sitting at the right hand of God, you know, the, that mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. language that we use. But the initial question that comes to my head is if there's one incarnation, would we need to bat? Would you baptize a Martian if they landed on either the White House lawn or at Windsor Castle? Well, let me just say something quickly about uh, why I are in that uh, direction, which is, but God came to us in Christ in a way that makes God visible to us and and communicates to us, and and it, that supremely communicative thing is for God to have a human body and speak human words with human gestures. And that would be enough to redeem, if they need to be redeemed, that's a whole extra question, um, life elsewhere in the universe. But I don't think it would speak to them in the same way that it's, it speaks to us. Um, and so in as much as God is not only coming among us, not only redeeming us, but also revealing himself to us in Christ perfectly. It seems to me that the way in which a species that has a very different body and a very different way of life and completely different linguistic uh, conventions and so on, I just, I'm not sure that the, that the human Christ would be so communicative to them. And so for that, that's why I um, think that there's something particularly beautiful about the idea of that kind of ra radiant, uh, full communication that comes from taking up, uh, you know, the, the species. Um, would I baptize uh, an alien? So that's a, a great question. And there's so much behind it that I, I think we could have a whole podcast on it. Um, so I think that I would want to say that I, let's imagine this is a sort of sentient, uh, sentient creature. I could recognize it as a beloved creature, uh, open to salvation. You know, I could recognize it as a bear of the image of God. Um, if I didn't baptize it, it wouldn't be because I was denying any of those things. Um, I think the question would be, which, so theologians talk about an economy of salvation. Uh, it's, that, it's the whole story and order and logic of salvation. It's, it's, a, it's a history, but it's also things like um, the place of the church and the sacraments and so on. And my question would be, does this Martian fall within that pattern, household of salvation or not. So if there's only one um, incarnation, then I guess the answer tends towards yes. And in which case you might say is by being uh, brought into the body of the human Christ that the Martian is to be redeemed, if the Martian needs to be redeemed. Um, and so maybe that would idea towards the, the yes. But I think it's also possible that there's more than one story of salvation. I mean, it'd, be, it'd be all within the one overarching story of who God is. Uh, but if, especially if it turns out that other places have a similarly rich and specific history of God's dealings with them, especially if it weren't to involve incarnation, then um, that's when I might be a bit more reticent about the idea of using the language of baptism, because it might be that there's a whole different set of sacraments that relate to that kind of uh, Nature. I mean, so for instance, if there was a, a a form of life that didn't involve water, or for which water was completely toxic, then uh, it seems like uh, God would adapt means of grace and, and salvation that were accommodated. It's a great theological word that were shaped according to the the form of life of the creature. Um, uh, but for me, it really comes down to the question of of whether there's a 
a kind of arc, a story, an economy, the theologians say, of, of salvation that would be worked out in a specific way in different places, in which case it might just seem a bit proprietorial for me to say, I've got to, I've got to baptize you. Um, or whether it all comes up, uh, it's, all, it's all gathered into the, the one sort of human centric uh, story. The Pope, called Pope Francis, uh, said uh, with characteristic generosity he would baptize uh, a Martian. Uh, and I think he was just there talking about um, uh, ex extending love and, and uh, recognizing the, the work of God as uh, a stretching to all things. <laughs> uh, excellent. Um, so you've shown today that the search for extraterrestrial life is much broader and more respectable than UFO sightings and Area 51 and those types of things. Um, however, are there any such sightings that you think might be worth a second look? Is there anything to this vast array of uh, often ridiculous and then funny sightings that that is actually worth exploring? Uh, we brought the tinfoil hats just for this section. <laughs> Uh, you're being much more uh, detrimental <laughs> than I am. You're going to get all sorts of angry, um, uh, angry uh, uh, letters for those comments, I'm sure. Uh, so I just am going to plead disciplinary uh, incompetence here. That I, this is just does not come under my area of, of study, and so I have no more to say about this than just a member of the public. Uh, so I think the one thing that I might be able to bring to this is to say. Traveling between stars, never mind between galaxies, is an extraordinarily difficult proposition because you need to travel at enormous speeds. So that's unbelievable amounts of energy. You need to be able to slow yourself down. And when you're traveling at those sorts of speeds, even to hit a sort of speck of dust is going to do astonishing damage. If you're traveling at a fraction, you know, reasonable fraction of the speed of light, you hit a, a speck of dust. Uh, it's, you know, it's like an enormous bomb going off. So I just don't think we should underestimate the technological challenges of traveling even between stars. So um, that's why I tend to take a you know, more, more, bit more skeptical view. I also think if you have the technology to be able to do that, you, it's astonishing. You know, you, you travel all these light years, the chances are you wouldn't then accidentally crash in Nevada. You know, it seems to me uh, you can't have it both ways. If if we have the kind of technological sophistication to be able to travel between stars, seems like um, it's not going to crash. Uh, so uh, in terms of sightings, I just, you know, I'd be agnostic, I think. Uh, I think it's interesting, as far as I know, that Congress has um, said in the last couple of years, hasn't it, that these things are not to be just dismissed. Um, I, I don't feel like I've got a dog in the fight to use a horrible, uh, <laughs> a horrible image. I don't feel like I've got a, um, a vested interest uh, in the answer to this being uh, yes or no. Um, I, I'm just, uh, I'm by nature not, uh, uh, not uh, by, by psychology, someone who particularly runs with conspiracy theories. So the idea that all of this is is uh, kind of somehow hidden. Uh, just, just psychologically doesn't sort of chime uh, with me. But uh, I do think it's, you know, I, I personally think it's much more likely that the signs of other life, if there is any, will come to us through the spectra of, of atmospheres of other stars. Possibly it'll come through. Broadcast, possibly it'll come through. Uh, contact seems to me that's uh, much less likely. But they're all good reasons for wanting to be prepared. And I, that's why I think it's worth the church investing in thinking about these things, um, the when there's when when or if there's evidence of life elsewhere in the universe, people will turn to their religious traditions for guidance for bearings. You know, uh, we talk a lot about secularization, but the vast majority of the world's population take their big you know, bearings in life and questions of meaning and, and purpose and their place in the world from a religious tradition, which. Uh, Christianity would be numerically the largest. And I think it's really important that the church has, and, and it is, it is, it's true, it is, uh, thinking about these things in advance so that if there's something to respond to, we can do it in an informed, measured, authoritative, calm uh, kind of way.
And I also think uh, that it's worth thinking about these questions, even if evidence of life in the universe never shows itself, because it helps us to come to familiar questions from new angles. So that question that you asked me, oh, well, if there's other life, does that devalue the human being, reveals something about the way in which we think about the image of God. Do we think of it as competitive or not, for instance? Um, the question of, is life elsewhere in the universe necessarily fallen or not, raises really interesting questions about the transmis transmission of sin, but also about the inevitability or otherwise of sin. So uh, if you come to the perspective that life doesn't have to be fallen, it's just not wired in that a creature species is going to make a rebellious choice inevitably, that tells us something about the nature of sin. So I think even if there isn't ever evidence of life elsewhere in the universe, it's it's turned out to me anyway, to be a really productive exercise to think through the key old, important, perennial questions in theology from this perspective and to come at them at slightly new ang angles and avenues, which seem to me to, to be quite productive and um, and uh, yeah help us to rejoice in all the old stuff uh, for new reasons. So if I could summarize maybe the key point for this, it's that if there is a discovery of extraterrestrial life, that's an opportunity for the church rather than something that gives us should give us any sort of existential angst or worry for how that might negatively impact us. It feels like you're presenting this as a, an exciting opportunity rather than something the church should be worried about. Well, I have to say, I do feel that way about almost everything. So you know, when, when Richard Dawkins talks about Christianity as being a claustrophobic tradition, I can just say that that is the opposite of my own experience, that it is expansive, confident, you know, with these great ancient traditions of thinking about things you, you can draw on, you can draw wells, draw water from those old wells. Um, I mentioned Aquinas one last time. He said, the job of, of theology is to think about God and everything in relation to God. So that's marvelous, thinking about everything in relation to God. But it's also important that it's everything. You know? So I think the, the theologian down the centuries has had the job of thinking about everything in relation to God. Nothing's off the table. And that kind of Confident, broad, expansive, open-hearted approach to thought seems to me characteristic of Christianity as I know. So, I, yeah, I, I take this in a fascinated, I hope, open-hearted sort of way. Uh, but I hope that the, the theologian would would uh, would do everything uh, that way. Uh, but we, as, uh, as we've also said, there's, there's a long theological history about thinking about this, so thinking about it, life elsewhere in the universe, explicitly since the middle of the 15th century. Uh, there's also some um, sociological, sort of eth ethnographic work Ted Peters did uh, with an associate, uh, just asking people, asking people from all sorts of different religious traditions, mainly Christian and then one, one or two other world religions, different kinds of, of Christian tradition. Um, would they be threatened, would their faith be threatened by evidence of life elsewhere in the universe? And the overwhelming response is no. So there's a bit of a difference from tradition to tradition, but the absolutely unequivocal, uh, you know, big scale response is that Christian believers say that they wouldn't be uh, threatened by it. The other interesting thing is that he asked atheists whether they thought the religious believers would be threatened, and they got that wrong. Um, but they, the, the answer was yes, they'd be very, you know, they'll be threatened by it. Um, Something like eighty twenty in both cases. You you ask the religious uh, believers, will you be threatened? And eighty percent say no, and twenty percent say yes. And you ask the uh, non-believers, would the believers be threatened by evidence of life elsewhere in the universe? Elsewhere in the universe, and they say eighty percent yes, uh, twenty percent no. I'm, I'm, those figures are ballpark. I'm just uh, dredging them from my memory, but it's something like that. So it's, it's, I think that's interesting uh, ethnographic work. You've got the historical story, and I think you've just got the character of Christianity that it just has no reason to be threatened in thinking about God's world and God's dealings. That's a great line to close on. Dr. Davison, thank you so much for your time. Any closing thoughts? Well, just to uh, congratulate you on this uh, first series of your new podcast. And to- I appreciate it. Yeah, to wish you all the best for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for being here with us.